We've, we've said a few times already that transforming your care can only be fulfilled with a proper joining up of housing, health, care and support. And this is an area that the, the Stormont Health Committee are now taking a, a particular interest in. And I think that's, that's very encouraging. In recent times, they've been looking at the, the role of supported living in potentially helping fulfill the vision of transforming your care and looking at the, the issue of the statutory residential care homes and whether um, an increase in supported living provision could help to, to deal with that issue. Um, Fiona Mac and Espy and I were pleased to give evidence to the inquiry last month and we're pleased that the committee have been getting out and about and learning from the experience of, of associations and partners. Um, the committee recently visited Cedar Court in, in Downpatrick, the Trinity Southeastern Trust Development, which has won a number of awards. And there's, there's, there's a range of excellent work in supported living for, for older people, including Hemsworth Court that we saw the film about, and also the, the pioneering Barnholt development in Carrick Fergus between the Northern Trust and Fold, which uh, Pamela referenced in her presentation. But in the, in the committee's inquiry, I was particularly impressed with the evidence of a King's College gerontologist called uh, Professor Anthea Tinker. And uh, she gave a, a real tour de force on the range of housing, care and support options potentially open to older people across the UK and uh, not just the conventional ones that we might provide. She referenced uh, an elderly couple that had decided to, to sell their home up and check into a travel lodge for 22 years. Um, I think if I, the, pro the prospect of retirement in a travel lodge, I think I might finish myself off now. <laughs> but um, apparently, you know, it worked for them. And uh, there was also, I believe, uh, she, she said that for, for a particularly affluent demographic, they find that their care and support needs are, are best met by spending a lot of the year on cruise ships. Again, uh, wouldn't be my choice, but if it works for them, good luck to them. So I think whilst these are, are perhaps frivolous examples, we do need to take a step back and think about how we're going to meet those range of needs for older people um, with, with increasingly limited resources. Um, the existing models that are the mainstay of provision now may or may not be the mainstay of provision in future. And I don't think we should be rolling forward existing services simply because that's, that's the budget that we've got. Um, fostering is a well-established model um, of providing housing care support for, for children and young people with particular needs. But there are only around um, 12,000 adult foster placements at the moment in the UK. So could adult fostering be a bigger part of the, the housing and support solutions for, for a range of groups, including um, people with learning disabilities, older people, and others? Um, Co-housing was another option that was mentioned by Professor Tinker. And this is the Spring Hill Housing Co-op in Stroud in Gloucestershire, which is the first new build co-housing scheme completed in the UK with uh, 34 homes ranging from one bedroom flats to five bedroom houses. There's also a, a three storey common house with a kitchen where meals are cooked and shared three times a week um, and a range of other activities happen. Um, decision making is by consensus. And so, you know, could co-housing for example um, be part of, of, of a way of meeting our care and support needs for the whole population over the next 20 or 30 years, enabling an, a, a, a range of options for people to live in safe and caring neighborhoods. There are obviously enormous challenges and opportunities in providing for a range of care and support needs. And with the state's role, I think, potentially declining over the next few decades, I think civil society will have to step up, not just in delivering more services, but also in designing them too. Um, as Pamela has recognized, the, the successful fulfillment of transforming your care does depend upon a significant increase in both the, the scale of provision of housing, care and support options in the community, but also the variety of services that, that's available. And of course, it's perfectly achievable to increase scale and variety 
but it will, it will require considerable effort and considerable investment. Um, in Great Britain, there's a whole range of think tanks and support organizations that are, that are looking at these and grappling with these issues in the areas of health, housing, care and support. Um, one of those referenced is the, the Housing Lynn Learning Improvement Network, which is a leading knowledge hub, hub for professionals in England involved in the planning, commissioning, designing, funding, building of housing with care for older people. And it is funded by the Department of Health. And I think we do need similar, similar thinking, similar work to be done in Northern Ireland. We do have, a, a, I think, a local committee of EROSH, which Colette is involved in. Um, Citra, I believe, are represented here today. We've got Wendy. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, Phil Saunders at the back there from Citra, who will be presenting this afternoon. Um, and, and we've also got the, the Stirling Dementia Centre do have uh, a, a small presence in Northern Ireland. But I think we do have to find ways of investing in, in grappling with these issues and coming up with our own solutions. And that will require, I think, some statutory investment. Um, the Department of Health in England also have a voluntary sector um, partners program, which has helped, for example, um, our sister federation in England, the National Housing Federation, to develop a range of housing solutions for, for older people. So that capacity building is needed. And given that it's about fulfilling key health objectives, I think the Northern Ireland Executive, the DHSSPS here, do have a role in contributing to that. Um, but I think we also, as housing associations and um, care and support providers, do have a, a duty to contribute as well. Um, I'm immensely proud of the work that associations and their partners are doing to deliver, um, to, to enable people to, to flourish through the supporting people services um, in providing purpose-built new build accommodation, in providing foyer and hostels for young, younger adults finding their feet and for homeless people, in offering a, a, a wide range of housing, care and support for older people, um, from sheltered accommodation on the one hand right through to residential and nursing care on the other. But our, our offer goes way beyond housing and support. Um, Triangle, who will be presenting later, have a range of social enterprises to help people develop, um, develop their skills and fulfill that, that, that right to work, such as um, this alternative angle, social enterprises. So in all, in all sorts of settings, and for all sorts of people, you're enabling um, huge numbers to live as independently as possible. Um, you're realizing potential and you're supporting people to flourish. And before lunch, um, after the break, we'll look at the, the progress that's been made, but the, the outstanding issues and challenges um, in particular areas of provision. Irrespective of the, the groups of people you're serving, the quality of what you provide is, is wholly dependent on being able to recruit and retain high quality staff. And so later on today, this afternoon, um, Kerry Anthony of DePaul and Tony Ruddy from Arc Housing will be describing how they're investing in their teams to do just that. Um, and we'll also be debating the thorny issue around pay and whether, um, whether pay is a big determinant in terms of being able to recruit and retain good staff and whether we as care and support providers could and should perhaps be, be paying the living wage to all staff. Um, this conference's title references the program that currently underpins the vast majority of our care and support provision. DSD has commenced a major review of SP that will have major implications for the future of the program. And I've included the, the terms of reference for that review within your delegate packs. <coughs> Stephen Martin, the deputy director and DSD responsible for the review, will be presenting on it after lunch. I don't know if any of, how many of you have read them, but to say that the terms of reference for this review are wide ranging would be an understatement. <coughs> Not only is the review seeking to determine the effectiveness and efficiency of the entire program today, but also to make an assessment on the efficiency and effectiveness of the program since it began in 2003. It's then going to go on to consider whether 
an adequate strategic, legislative and, and administrative framework is in place for the delivery of SP and make, make recommendations on how that effectiveness and efficiency can be improved. Um, I mean, it just seems an incredibly ambitious um, scope for a single study or a single project. Whereas it might be possible to make some high-level um, assessment of the programme's effectiveness and efficiency now, I'm not sure that that can be done re retrospectively for the last 11 years with any degree of accuracy. Um, and shouldn't the, the legislative and policy changes that might be required be considered separately once we have considered issues of effectiveness and efficiency? Some might accuse me of uh, and, uh, supporting people providers of being un uncritically wedded to the status quo, but I don't believe that's the case. We've got to be open to reform, including radical reform, if that's what's necessary to ensure that the programme continues to fulfil its objectives. But it has to be the right reform. And one of my concerns is that this review is taking place within a, a context where uh, I think there's a lack of understanding about supporting people um, and per as a result, I think our elected representatives are perhaps less committed to supporting people than, than they should be. So I think in, where there is a lack of understanding in SP or a lack of support for SP, it's our job as the, the providers of the programme to lead in putting it right. And I think there's a whole range of ways we can do that. You know, Helm have produced a film, but hosting politicians and others to visit your schemes and see the difference that you're making in people's lives, I think, is, is absolutely vital. So with regard to the, the DSD review, we're willing, able, and committed to make a, a full contribution to the process of positive reform. But I think our, our view is that this process has to be um, taken place within a, an absolute commitment to the fundamentals of supporting people. You know, SP is a housing program that funds a wide range of housing related support. Supporting people budgets emerged originally from the um, housing benefit. And although housing support greatly complements health and social care services, and we're absolutely committed to complementing those health and social care services, housing support services are clearly distinct. It's therefore vital that SP remains a dedicated housing support program um, people in mixed funded schemes with high care needs have as much right to continued housing support as anyone else. Um, the talk about how, you know, whether and how the some or all of the budget might be transferred to health, I think is creating major concern, major uncertainty, which is not enabling us to plan for the future. Another key priority around supporting people is clearly the funding of the programme. And at around 70 million each year, this is a significant budget. But revenue funding has been frozen now, I think it's for seven years for most schemes. Any fact that there was in services has, has been trimmed long ago. And the continued squeeze on SP funding is, I believe, now threatening the quality and the viability of many services. Whilst you as providers are contractually obliged to pay NJC uh, pay increases, this hasn't been reflected in increases in the funding you receive. Holding on to good staff is becoming, becoming an issue. Of course, in tough times, all government budgets have to be carefully scrutinised. But I think this does not mean that reductions in supporting people budgets are necessary or inevitable. Um, we know that across the UK, Health spending has been, fro has been protected in real terms over this um, period of austerity. And we've also, in Northern Ireland, made a, a political decision that we're going to protect uh, vulnerable people from the worst excesses of welfare reform. So although the, the officials will, of course, do most of the work and present the options, at the end of the day, the level and type of supporting, supporting people program that emerges from this review will be subject to political decisions. And I think, therefore, it's absolutely vital that we make as strong and concerted a case to the politicians 
to invest and strengthen this programme, including through additional funding um, over the next few months. We, we've spoken about TYC and Home as the Hub and Shift Left. And of course, um, I, I'm glad that this is being done in a way that, that protects budgets on the acute side. Um, but a Shift Left requires properly funded care and support services. And in terms of a, sh a Shift Left in thinking and budgets, um, it seems that political attention and funding continues to shift inexorably to the right. Um, but properly funded housing support services are vital in, 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 in facilitating the shift right, sorry, the shift left. We've spoken already about assistive technologies and the, 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 the hugely exciting opportunities that electric, electronic assistive technologies offer. Um, but on such a fundamental issue, it seems like there is not um, any degree of certainty for providers, for landlords, about actually who is responsible for, for the, the capital and revenue costs of electronic assistive technologies. And I understand that that is a major delay in getting new schemes commissioned and built. And so on such key fundamental issues, we really do need clarity um, and a, a commitment to proper, proper funding. I think it is true that, that supporting people is an under-researched programme. 700, 600 million, I think, of public funding in Northern Ireland has been spent. And so it's right that there is an assessment of effectiveness through the review. Um, a few years ago, the, 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 the Whitehall Department in England responsible for SP commissioned um, Capgemini, an international consulting firm, to undertake a cost-benefit analysis of the Supporting People programme. And that study found that supporting people produced net significant financial benefits to the exchequer in England, in addition, of course, to the, the vastly improved outcomes and quality of life for the people benefiting. And so we're, we're pleased that um, just now, NICFA, their Centre for Economic Empowerment, have commissioned um, CITRA to repeat that analysis in, in Northern Ireland. And Phil Saunders um, will be presenting on the initial findings of that research earlier in the, uh, later on this afternoon. But we expect that as in England, the Supporting People programme here will be demonstrated to, to be generating net financial benefits to the NI executive. And therefore, that makes our, our case for proper funding all the more stronger. Um, after the break, Brian O'Kane is going to provide an overview of current developments um, in, in supporting people. And one of the issues that I think he'll address is the, the, th the thinking about how housing support services are going to be commissioned and procured in future. Um, we know that the, the kind of the specter of procurement has been on the horizon for some time with regard to, to SP. Um, for those of us working in housing associations, I think we found the public procurement regime in, in Northern Ireland to be, um, to have problems, you know, major problems potentially. Um, we all understand the rationale for ensuring that we are pursuing value for money and effectiveness and open competition as strongly as possible. Um, but actually, our experience of public procurement in the housing association sector has been that it adds significantly to complexity, to administration, that it creates delays and actually further costs. Um, there's a good example of maintenance contracts, for example, um, being aggregated to such a level that only a few players can compete and good local firms that were providing good local value, good value for money services, providing jobs in Northern Ireland have been driven out. Um, and, and so, you know, th that, that's a result of a crude approach at competitive tendering in pursuit of the public procurement regime. Um, this is uh, Brendan Sarsfield, the chief executive of Family Mosaic, which is one of the big English housing associations and a leading care and support provider. Last year, he wrote a powerful article in the, the trade magazine Inside Housing, and it was entitled Race to the Bottom. And it described a race to the bottom where English local authorities um, have embraced cost-based tendering and his conclusion was that tendering drives down wages, destabilizes services, crushes innovation, and draws limited resources away 
from the real work with service users. That's a pretty damning indictment. And that's from an association that does have a commercial focus, that does understand um, the realities that local authorities are working within. So I think we, we must work with statutory partners to, to improve commissioning and procurement, but we have to do everything we can to avoid a similar race to the bottom here. For SP to flourish, um, it requires a true partnership with, with service users and with providers. And I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged that I think there is thinking going on about how providers and service users can both have a, a much greater input into, um, into the commissioning structures. And I hope that Brian will be able to perhaps elaborate on that. There has been good partnership working between associations providers and our statutory partners. For example, um, in the work that's been going on in the last few months around unblocking barriers to new supported living schemes. And we, ha we have to build on that because I think for supporting people to succeed, it has to be a genuine partnership between statutory partners, associations and providers. And I think that's why it, it is concerning that when we do have such a fundamental review of the Supporting People programme that neither landlords nor providers are represented on the, the key group steering the review of the programme. And I hope that that will be rectified. Um, there's talk about a project advisory group, but five or six years into the, f five or six months into the review, that has yet to meet. And so I think we do, we do need genuine involvement and engagement, um, not just cursory consultation late, late in the day. Um, so we hope that, however belatedly, that providers, service users and their families can have a meaningful opportunity to contribute to the review of SP. And through the CRISP, um, the committee representing independent supporting people providers, Ricky and I will be pushing for, for full engagement in the review. So to conclude, um, supporting people services are making an immense contribution in helping 17,000 people across Northern Ireland to fulfill their potential. And the most important outcome is obviously improved and changed lives. But I believe that the programme is delivering net financial benefits to the Northern Ireland Executive. We're at a key juncture with the, the implementation of TYC, the review of supporting people, and also the, the spending priorities for the Northern Ireland Executive post-2015 beginning to be determined. So where does that leave us? Well, I suppose, first of all, we, we need to continue to, deliver ex continue to deliver excellent services and push um, as hard as we can for proper funding as soon as possible to protect the, the quality and the viability of existing provision. We know that the challenges for care and support providers are going to quickly intensify over the next few years with, with continuing pressure in budgets and continuing increase in needs. And we do have to work with government to ensure every penny goes as far as possible to work with them in reform, but also look beyond government at what we ourselves can do. So we commit ourselves to working constructively with Transforming Your Care and the SP Review to help our statutory partners do their extremely difficult job. But it, there has to be a true partnership based on a, a co-production of services, not us, not us just simply being seen as delivery agents. And as well as doing a good job and, and working on the development of services, we also need to get out there and, as I said earlier, vigorously make the case for our work to politicians and to, to opinion formers. Because unless politicians and the people making the decisions across the civil service understand the value of SP, um, then the programme's future will not be secured. So, not a lot to do then. But I think as well as those immense challenges, there are really exciting opportunities um, in electric, electronic assistive technologies and a whole range of other, uh, other ways. And so NIFA and our member housing associations look forward to working with you to further improve services so that together we can support even more people to flourish. Thank you.